Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And thank you, Diane, for that introduction. Um, I want to go ahead and share my screen. Um, Diane, can you enable my ability to share the screen? So again, I am a licensed clinical mental health counselor and a registered art therapist here in Hendersonville. Um, I've been in practice for going on six and a half years, and I, I love the work that I do. I was very grateful to, to stumble upon the path of art therapy um, when I was an undergraduate, and it's been a, a lifelong love affair ever since. In addition to being an art therapist, I'm also in training to be a somatic experiencing practitioner, which is a, a, a trauma healing modality that really focuses on helping people get in touch with their bodies and um, learning the things that they didn't have at the time they experienced these events and what they can do now to, to help heal from it. Again, I'm a mixed media artist. Um, I've had the opportunity to paint three different barefooting bears and um, I had an artscape banner a few years ago. Um, I love making artist books and um, altered books as well as painting on canvas with collage and acrylic paint. Um, in my work, I specialize in helping people with anxiety, depression, PTSD, and complex PTSD, um, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's um, focused on trauma that happens during the early childhood years or when there are layers of trauma that happens throughout um, the course of our lives. So I wanted to give a little bit of context to what I'll be talking about um, a little bit later um, over the last year, we've all collectively in this country across the world have experienced the trauma of COVID-19 and all of the different effects that that might have on our lives. Um, some of my clients have faced unemployment or underemployment, food scarcity, um, risk of losing their housing, and um, of course, all of the emotional effects of, of not being as close to friends and family or being able to see them or get hugs from them on a regular basis and just having everything about their lives uh, shift or come to a halt. According to the American Psychological Association, who puts out a Stress in America report every month, um, as of January, more than 80% of Americans reported emotions associated with prolonged stress, and that includes feeling anxious, sad, and angry. So one of the things that can happen when we experience stress is we, you know, when we're feeling grounded and present and relaxed, um, we're in that social engagement place. Our nervous system um, has these cycles where um, we can start out feeling really grounded. And then as we experience more stress, we can go up into this fight, flight or freeze state. Um, so in the social engagement space, we're feeling connected and safe um, we're feeling curious and we're in touch with our creativity and we're able to feel a compassion. And as we start to uh, experience more stress, we might have a fight reaction where we're feeling irritation and frustration, rage or anger, or we might have a flight reaction where we're feeling panic, anxiety, fear, worry or concern about the future. What starts to happen as we're in that fight flight mode if we're stuck in there for a long enough time, or if whatever's happening is too overwhelming, we can go up the bell curve into the freeze. And that's where we start to feel depressed, numb, a sense of shame, feeling trapped, helpless or hopeless. We might experience a loss of energy or feel helpless or shut down, or even feel disconnected from other people or ourselves, meaning disconnected from our emotions or disconnected from our physical bodies. So ideally, when stress happens, we can go up the bell curve and come back down to a place of feeling grounded. But because COVID-19 has extended, um, we're about at the year mark now, many of, many of us, many of my clients are entering into this free state. And um, some people call it hitting their COVID wall where they just feel like, okay, I've done all the things I know how to do. I don't know what else there is to do to help shift out of this place of feeling stuck. So I wanted to share a few things that you can do using the art materials you have on hand to help shift things and get to the place where you're feeling more regulated or feeling relaxed or just wanting to get back in touch with your art. So the first way that we can use these materials is through mindful mark ma making. And I recommend that this some kind of mindfulness, whether it's 
mindful mark making with art materials or another mindfulness or meditation practice happens at least once a day. One of the things I like to do with my clients is an exercise called drawing the breath. You just need a sheet of paper and something to write with, like a pen or pencil, a colored pencil or a marker. And you can set the mood by um, having some music or some candles, or if you just want to get straight to it, you can as well. But you start by softening your gaze and using your, your writing instrument. You want to gently draw a line to the right as you inhale. And without picking that line up, draw a line to the left as you exhale. And you want to try to increase the length of your lines over time. Because as you start to take that deep breath, I mean, from your diaphragm, um, that space above your belly button. And that's rather than a breath that's from up here from your lungs, um, you'll notice that um, you'll start to feel a little bit more calm. And this is something that can help take the edge off any uh, feeling of irritation or anxiety that you might be experiencing. So again, inhale in one direction and without picking up your writing tool, exhale in the other direction. And you wanna do this through the length of the page, but for at least two minutes. Another exercise um, that you can do to increase your mindfulness is a felt, self, a felt sense body diagram. And again, you just need a sheet of paper and some assorted markers or other writing tools. So we start by drawing an outline of the body on your paper and it doesn't have to be anything realistic. I like to use the gingerbread cookie gingerbread cookie rather as a, an example for my clients because um, we don't want to get into that sense of oh, my art's not good enough. This doesn't look like a real person. Uh, this is just a tool to get to what's actually happening inside. Um, so starting from the head, the top of our head down to our feet, we'll use our tools to illustrate the sensations that are currently present in each area of our body. So when we're feeling relaxed and calm, we might feel a sense of openness our breath might be even, our heart rate might be even, our fingers and toes might feel loose or they might feel warmth. If we're feeling a sense of connection or love, we might feel warmth all over our bodies. Um, the example I have here with someone who is experiencing anxiety and there was a swirly sensation in their stomach and their heart was beating faster and they had some tension behind their eyes. So what's important is not to necessarily change any of the things that are happening, but just to check in. And this can help decrease that sense of dissociation or disconnection by really just scanning our bodies and seeing what's there. And once we know what's there, then we have more ideas of what we can do to change things later on if we want to. Another example of a mindfulness activity is watercolor mandala paintings. And these are really loose, flowy paintings. We're not making anything in particular. So the supplies that I recommend are, of course, watercolor paints or inks, uh, brushes, watercolor paper, because it, it's strong enough to hold all that water, and at least 50% or 70% rubbing alcohol and some table salt. So using your watercolors or your inks, you want to just create an area of color within the circle of your paper. And notice how the colors may blend and shift into each other. And as you drop some rubbing alcohol or sprinkle table salt onto those colors, Notice the effect um, that it has on the paint and any changes in your sensations as you're working. So you might notice a shift in the muscle constriction or a shift in your breath or a shift in your heart rate as you're experimenting with the materials. And think about how those shifts in sensation or shifts in thought or mood uh, tell you about your openness to change because we've all had to deal with a lot of change and uncertainty and um, opportunities to be more flexible over the last year. So the second category includes art for emotional expression. And these are activities that you can just do as needed as you're feeling frustrated or anger, angry or um, whenever you just want a chance to express whatever it is that you're feeling. The first one is intuitive painting and you can use paints of your choice and paper and brushes. In this example, I used acrylic paint and you just want to paint it all out. Um, whatever fears, dreams, joys, frustrations, anxieties that might be present, um, use that paint and paper and, and get it out of your head and out of your body and onto the paper. And give yourself permission to just be inside the color, the paint, the process of painting, rather than trying to form specific images or trying to depict a specific scene. 
So in this example, I alternated between warm colors and cool colors and towards the end added black, grays and whites. And it started out very abstract. And um, some of the forms that might be present in the original or in the, some of the top layers just got faded out and transformed into other things. It doesn't really have a, a purpose or a goal, or at least I didn't have a, a goal when I first started out. And then as things progressed, certain images and themes become more, more apparent. Another activity is incorporating layers into your art journals. Um, if you're not familiar with an art journal, it's just a blank sketchbook or nowadays they actually have or, or are selling art journals, which has a heavier weight paper. Um, and the purpose is just to have a place to add images in addition to or instead of words like you would do with the regular written journal. So the advantage of adding layers is that you can depict through imagery or through words, whatever it is that's going on, and adding layers hides some of what um, you've, you've shared, or at least it can obstruct it a little bit. So in this example, I think I used a, a charcoal pencil to, to write the words, and then I went over it with a wet brush. So it eliminates some of the fear of, oh my gosh, I wonder what would happen if somebody were to read this or to see it. Um, the whole point is just to get whatever you're feeling out. I love using tissue paper because you can really play with the things that you want to be hidden and the things that you want to be shown, um, as well as other types of paint, um, like watercolors on top of words, um, allows some things to be more obscure than others. And it can be a fun way of just showing um, or writing what you're, you're feeling in a way that doesn't have to be exposed. This final activity is called an emotional landscape drawing or painting. And again, you just want a sheet of paper and whatever drawing or painting tools you have on hand. So before you start, imagine that your emotions could form a landscape. And what would that landscape look like in terms of color, setting, style, and feeling? For example, would your emotions form a wooded scene or an ocean scene or something more dry or arid like a desert or a field? Would it be mountainous or flat? What would the weather or climate be like and how would that represent the things that you're feeling? And through those depictions, create a drawing or painting to represent your current emotional landscape. I also wanted to share a couple of art examples that you can use for social connection. And um, the recommendation is that these are done at least weekly. The first one is artist trading cards. And for those that are unfamiliar, these are little two and a half by three and a half size um, cards that you can create a piece of artwork on and trade with other individuals locally or around the world at different organized swap events. Um, these are great because there are no rules. You can literally put anything onto that card. The only rule is that it's two and a half by three and a half. And you can do it virtually. There are lots of online swaps that have been happening for decades. Um, as well as, you know, you can do it within your own little pen pal group. A couple more ideas for social connection is to create a little free art supply library where instead of books, you can have art supplies or created works of art that um, the people walking by can then trade. So if you have a stack of oil pastels that you're not using, you can add it to the library. And there may be a little kid or another adult walking by who can see that and it would spark some um, creativity in them and they can use it and then maybe share another art supply with you that you can use. And similar to the artist trading card swaps, you can do an art journal swap. And this could be great to do with the people currently living in your home or in your neighborhood where you can maybe put it in your little free art library um, or have a, a meeting point where you can do a journal swap. Or of course, you can always send that journal back and forth through the mail um, with your, your friends and loved ones across the, the world. So the key with all of these different activities is it's about the process, not the product. Um, I incorporate a lot of mindfulness uh, principles into my work with my clients. And some of the, the key ones are cultivating a sense of non-judgment. So we're not judging the work that we're producing. Um, it doesn't matter if we like it or if we think other people will like it. It's all about just doing it. It's about being in the process and having that be okay. And approaching our artwork with a beginner's mind. So 
we all have a lot of rules that are really important when we're making art to show or to sell. Um, but when we're making art for ourselves, I want to invite you to put those rules, rules aside. Um, because when we can get into a place of being curious and experimenting, uh, what we put out is often more authentic to what we're really feeling, meaning those, those emotions that we might have a hard time accessing as we go about our day-to-day -day life are more likely to come out when we're in a, a playful place. And, and that's what's really important. Finally, we're not striving to um, create something. You know, we set an intention at the beginning that the work that we're going to be doing is more process oriented. It's not fair to ourselves to switch it halfway through and think, oh, well, I really like this and I'd like to sell it. And now I'm going to try to shift it and make it into this beautiful piece. Um, I, I wanna invite you to just really stick to that intention. And if you still like it, you can always replicate it but we wanna have the opportunity to allow what's actually inside of our brains and our bodies to come out on our papers or canvases or art journals so that it's not just getting stuck there. Um, I think we all bring to the table a sense of a, an art scar or some experience where someone has judged the work that we've done negatively and that can hold us back and we can get stuck in fear but fear and curiosity can't really live. We can't coexist within us at the same time. So I want to invite you to choose curiosity instead. So if you're interested in learning more or have questions later on, I want to invite you to just uh, get in touch. My phone number is listed here and that's 828-785-4789. I can also be reached via email at kgilmore at Mountain Creative Arts. Um, and on my website, which is mountaincreativearts.com, there are links to both my Facebook and Instagram profiles. Kara, thank you so much. That was really enlightening. Um, uh, as a, a person who gets so caught up in producing the product and not enjoying the process, um, I'm thinking about rethinking how some of my time in my studio goes each day. I feel frustrated at times. And, um, you know, I, I think all of us as artists, we really strive to, to judge what we do and um, forget about how enjoyable the process is of creating artwork. Um, I love the idea of the, uh, the art library. I've already got ideas running around in my head about how I can add a little cubby hole in my studio area. And I've got art supplies that I try and I don't use. And um, I think we've probably, we've got things that come into the gallery that people just donate. So I love that idea. And the trading cards, I could see that something that, um, that our members might really enjoy. Um, does anyone have any specific questions for Kara? If you do, um, you can just uh, raise your hand. Let's see if we can get pretty much everybody on screen. You can all switch to gallery view if you want to be able to see everyone. And if anybody has a question, just wave at us and you can, or you can go ahead and unmute yourself and um, ask Kara some questions. And who's on Galaxy S9? Me, oh, Ruth Ellen. <laughs> oh, hi, Ruth Ellen. <laughs> Welcome. Ruth Ellen um, is another one of our members, and I know she also teaches. Um, so uh, let's see, we've got a few people opening up their phones. Anyone have any questions? Sam does. I can just ask them if they can hear me. Sure. Can, can you hear? Can you hear Samuel? I can hear. Can you hear me ask a question, Kara? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, good. Um, I have um, a friend of mine who has been experiencing some uh, anxiety and some some childhood trauma for a long time. And it has just come to his attention that he needs to do something about this. And now he doesn't know what to do. Um, he's been to a couple of different um, more traditional therapists and it just, they didn't connect. Um, so he sort of gave up, but he's very artistic. Um, he does a lot with photography. He does a lot with painting. Um, and I thought I might, it might be a good reference to work with you. Um, but I never made the connection until today. 
that that would be a great connection for him. Uh, if if you think that that's someone that you'd like to work with. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for thinking of me. I'm, I'm happy to chat with you further about whether that would be a good fit. Um, and of course, your friend is also welcome to contact me directly with any questions he might have. I do offer a free 30 minute consultation. Um, right now, I'm only meeting virtually with clients. So we would be meeting over Zoom and yeah. that 30 minutes would give you know, the prospective client a, a good chance to, or a chance to get to know me and see if that would feel right. And for me to see if whether I'm an appropriate fit, because um, I have a connections with lots of other therapists um, all over Western North Carolina who are doing similar or very different work that, you know, some things work better for, for other, some people than others. Yeah, yeah, well, everything you were showing in your presentation, um, it just, his, his name, his face just kept coming to mind, and I thought, this is exactly, I think, how he could process things um, using a talent that he already has. So. I don't have a question. This is Ruth Ellen again, but um, I'm really interested in the concepts, and I love uh, what you've shared with us. It's an inspiration. And I think, Paula, were you waving your hand, or is that Lisa? There's Lisa. She finally found us. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I didn't actually try to get on until, like, a little before 1.30, and then I couldn't, so I ran up to Paula's house. <laughs> um, well, this is just an idea, and I will follow up on it, but... Uh, one of my neighbors made our neighborhood a really cool little book uh, house or hotel. And like he's really, library. you know, a good carpenter and very creative. He might be willing if other people wanted to have a little art house built, he might be willing to do that for a pretty nominal fee. So I'm, I'm going to ask him, I'm going to have him do one for our neighborhood. If anybody's yeah. interested, they can call you. Yeah. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Um, the I know Sanctuary Brewing used to have their um, like clothing exchange outside on the wall where people went and just hung up things that they rather than take them to Goodwill and people would pick them up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a tradition. I'm not sure if the new owners, because now it's a different name, but just this morning, my husband had a pair of big size 12 hunting boots that he hasn't worn in years and he was going to take them um he actually first said i'm going to put these in the trash and i said absolutely not um and we, i said maybe sanctuary but i wasn't sure if they were still doing it but i'm i feel certain we could find a place somewhere for a for an art uh they are yes okay. yeah. they are still I can't children. Maybe Oklahoma would be a good place to put an art exchange too. I bet, and I know the owners of um, of um, Southern Appalachian Brewery. Uh, both the owners actually have fine art degrees, and they're very supportive of the arts. And that's another spot where we could do something. So those are great ideas. All right. Well, again, thank you. Pardon me. Oh, Wendy, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I love that idea of this, um, the art library. I've taught for 15 years, and uh, we moved here at the end of October, built a house. And I noticed a neighborhood girl, um, she had stopped by, and I could tell she needed something. And um, I had given her some something, and she had come back with a canvas that was painted. So she, I said, well, I'm an artist, too. So I had given her like a bunch of supplies that I don't use. And I, I found that it was just so, um, I think, good for both of us to share that, you know, love of art. And so I'm thinking of that. I would love to get the name of someone that would build that because I do have, you know, I have, uh, I finally, I, I used to live on 25 acres and be kind of isolated. So I love, you know, having neighbors now. And I would love uh, to start something like that up just to, to put some pencils or paper or paint, you know, and just, uh, or even books, you know. So that's a great idea. I like that. So yeah, if you get the name of someone that builds the, um, like those little houses, that would be great because I am not a builder. 
So yeah. are you on the, are you a new member? Or I am a new member. Yeah. Okay. So I'm relatively new. I don't think I have you on my list, but okay. I'm sure that President Diane has you on her list. So I'll contact you. That, that'd be awesome. I'd love okay. to, to buy one and put one right out front of my house or, you know, somewhere over here. Yeah. So thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a great idea. I can see them popping up all over Tina. Um, Maxine is going to move out to Colorado. She's been a very long time member, Maxine Tetro. And um, she's starting to go through her stuff and she has an immense library of water color painting books um and i'm trying to uh find homes for them cool. uh i've got bags full and um i'm supposed to go back over there and, and pick up some more and i'll uh, i'll be donating some to the friends of the library if i can't find artists who want to take some home um, maybe i could Bring a couple of bags full when we um, drop off the uh, paintings or the um, fabulous fakes. And people could look through the bags and just pick up whatever they want. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And actually, we finally have our membership roster. Um, Sharon Richmond has been hard at work um, between Sharon and uh, Mary. Um, and Jean and I getting everything completed. So following this meeting, we are going to send out the updated roster to all of our members. Usually we do that with the renewal in January, but um, we'll be doing it this month since we finally got it all um, over in Sharon's hands. So you'll all have everyone's current contact information. <laughs> Sam um, Ewell is the owner of A Cheerful Word, um, and she's going to talk with us about writing your memoirs, and it seems like these two presentations really go together well, because I would think for all of us as artists, our memoirs probably include a lot of artwork. Mm -hmm. um, she's actually doing a three-part workshop at uh, Blue Ridge Community uh, College with the OLLI program. That's the on life, long living. I just that, finished it. Oh, she just finished that. So she's been helping people write their stories and teaching workshops since 2006. And again, her um, business is actually located on Fifth Avenue, um, just around the corner from Main Street. Um, so I will turn it over to Sam and we'll try not to squeal here. <laughs> I'm going to turn my microphone down and good to go. Okay. If I can, can everyone hear me? Yay, no squeals. <laughs> well, it's good to see you all and meet you all, many of you, so a few of you I know or have known and at one point or another uh, as we've crossed paths. Um, and thank you very much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here, especially on a really pretty Sunday afternoon. Uh, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, memoir writing. And first I wanted to define what memoir is and what it isn't. Because people often say, oh, I'm, I'm too young to write a memoir, or it's too much work, or I don't, it's boring because it's just all the information sort of in chronological order from your life. Well, really it's not. A memoir is not an autobiography, which really does chronicle all of the events of your life. Memoir is usually a chapter in your life, uh, that you want to commemorate, or it's a thread that runs through your life. Um, and you all being artists, it, the thread running through your lives, um, your memoir may be centered around your art. When you first discovered art, whether it was a, sort of a saving grace for you at some point or another, uh, how you stumbled on it, the people that you've met, the experiences that you've had, that could be one whole memoir. And I believe that most of us have more than one memoir within, within us. Uh, but I've also known several artists who really don't love to write or they don't like to write a lot of content. So um, a few years ago, I was asked in 2017, I was asked to create um, 
a, a short, like, well, 30 to 45 minute um, workshop on memoir writing, but it was for these people who were in the Air Force who did not want to write. And I said, well, why don't you want to write? I don't, I'm not quite sure you understand. And they said, well, you know, our spouses are deployed all the time. We're moving from place to place all the time. And I either lose it or I lose momentum. And we just don't have a routine that lasts longer than any particular host uh, around the world. And I said, I think I can help you. So I created something called symbolic journaling. Um, and if I can share my screen, that would be super. Um, and I created this because uh, for one is for privacy reasons. And two, uh, let's see, I can share. There we go. Ta-da. Uh, this is what my, this is just one little square on my symbolic journal. And what you do is you take um, a double page of blank journaling and draw these little tiny squares all across it. There's about 30 per page. And I've just blown this one up for uh, a sample. Uh, and in it, you can determine what you want to include. So um, if you're not really a writer, but you want to commemorate the journey of your life, maybe you want to adopt some new habits uh, relating to health, happiness, or connection with others. Um, you Perhaps symbolic journaling might just work for you instead of sitting down and trying to write out your thoughts or do like bullet journaling is a big thing right now. Um, minimalist journaling was a thing a few years ago. And I've sort of combined the best of from all the types of journaling that I've seen and created this. It takes just two minutes a day, and then you've captured a handful of moments that you most want to preserve. When I was asked, uh, when I asked, the, it was these Air Force spouses, what they wanted um, and what they desired most from a lifetime of moving, here's what came up often most. Um, they wanted, number one was they wanted a way to remember life as a military spouse and the daily moments they tended to miss because they were always getting ready for a new post, a spouse's deployment or dealing with children or some world or personal health event. And they just didn't have a way to do that. The second one that came up was I never find time to develop new healthy habits for myself. The third one was I feel like life is flying by and I have nothing to show for it. Another one was, I wanna honor my own life and not just the life of my spouse. Um, and those in the military will realize that it's often about the spouse and your life revolves around everything that they do. Then um, the fifth one was, I wanted to remember the connections with the so many people I've met who've made my life a joy. Um, because people come and go so much in and out of their lives, um, they really wanted to remember all of those people who have meant so much, even if it was just for a short time. Um, the sixth one uh, really surprised me. They said, I want to keep my journal personal. I'm afraid if I write down my days, it'll fall into the hands of someone who will judge me harshly. Um, and this goes back to something Kara talked about, where she talked about smudging that part of the journal so that it wasn't easily readable or covering it up with tissue paper. This is sort of the same idea in a different way. Um, and the last one, of course, was they wanted to remember the amazing experience, experiences they have in life, even the day-to-day -day, um, amazement that we all experience. And so symbolic journaling was born and it took me a few tries, but by combining this best of from all of the different methods, I came up with a way to commemorate our days privately, powerfully, and easily. Um, so the first thing you do is you create a personal key of symbols. And I'll, I'll describe my key of symbols um, so that you understand what I'm talking about. If you, if you look at the very top of the box, it has a little arrow coming off the left and it um, is a, we went to Chesky Krumlov, which is in the Czech Republic. And so on the top of the box, I write down if and where I've traveled. And because this was a common thing for me to do while I was living in Germany for three years, I had lots of these little arrows. I was coming and going to and from different places in Germany and around Europe. So that was a great way for me to capture the days that I went someplace or came back from someplace. 
inside at the top left, there's a circle. Um, and for me, <clears throat> my key says, that tells me if I stretched that day or if I did some yoga that day. A filled in circle means yes, an empty circle means nope, I didn't stretch or do any yoga that day. Uh, the number to the right of that is how many meaningful conversations did I have that day? Um, because to me, that's something that's important and it's something that I wanna track and commemorate. Um, so my symbolic journal um, does a couple of things. Yes, it commemorates the moments that happened, but it also helps me build healthy habits. And usually these habits are around happiness, connection, spirituality, and health. Um, so I have found this just the quickest way to do that. And it's fun, it looks really cool. I'll show you a picture of a double spread of what these look like when you've finished a couple of months worth. Uh, to the right of the number two, uh, so I had two meaningful conversations that day, is, um, a little envelope. It's supposed to be an envelope. I am not a great artist. <laughs> My art comes out in words, so that's an envelope uh, because I. it's very important for me to write uh, handwritten letters and mail them to people or hand them to people. Um, that's how I maintain connection. And, um, and I just wrote a two next to that because I sent out two that day. The heart to the right um, indicates intimacy. What was my intimate life like that day? And that's not just sex. Intimacy can refer to the closeness you have to a partner, a friend, your circle of friends or family. You define any of these in ways that are meaningful to you. Um, and the next one is a, an R and a D. And that means, did I read a book today? And did I watch a documentary today? Because those at the time were things that were really important to me. I wasn't reading the kinds of books I wanted to. So by tracking it, it was keeping it in front of me. The diamond um, is simply, how did I feel about my professional work today? How did my business do? Um, the face is, uh, as you can imagine, a happiness indicator for the overall day. And the triangle underneath it is very specific to me. Did I have a migraine that day and how bad was it? Um, if it's filled in, I had a migraine. Um, if it's empty, I didn't have any pain at all. Um, and if it's sort of spotted, it was maybe a moderate migraine. Um, so I had happy days and I still had a migraine, but I've had them for 30 years. So I have learned to cope to a certain degree. Um, now, if we go off to the far left, this is my favorite part. You see that long number, 20,293. That is how many days I've been alive. <laughs> and I think that's a great way to sort of commemorate our days just by writing the numbers up the side of this box. Um, and to find out how many days you've been alive, you can go to a website um, and it's, uh, it's imrodmartin.com. I'm, Roden, I'm Rod Martin Um And you can just type in the date of your birth and it tells you how many days you've been alive. <clears throat> and I just think that's a, a fun thing to track. Uh, my daughter thought it was really fun. She's like, wow, you've been alive a lot of days. <laughs> you're really old. And I'm like, hey, watch it. You're, you're turning 30 here. <laughs> you're about to be on your own. <clears throat> Double digits or multi-digits. Now I'm going to skip down to the bottom left, the W at the bottom left. For me, that's how far did I walk today? If it's a big W, I walked a lot. If it's a little W, I walked a little. Um, the plus sign, or it could be a minus sign, tells me, did I have any alcohol that day? Because um, <clears throat> that was just something I was tracking. Because um, we went out to eat a lot. And I found myself putting on some um, travel pounds. <laughs> so I was trying to track, am I really drinking a glass of, or two of wine every single day? And it turned out for a while, I, yeah, I was. Because we were eating out at these fabulous places. Uh, the next series of letters is vegetables animal, fruit, grain, or sweets. Um, it's what food I ate that day. Um, I, we were trying really hard to become um, or to remain on a vegan or vegetarian diet. And in Germany, we discovered that was very difficult. Um, so we tried um, and by the time we moved to Bavaria, um, it was impossible. It's just the land of sausage. It was, we, we, I said, all right, I'll start back up when I move back to the States. <laughs> 
um, on the bottom, underneath the box, there's an X. An X uh, indicates that I did not sleep well. A check mark indicates that I did sleep well um, because that has a lot to do with my migraines as do the next set of two numbers next to each other on the bottom. Um, 0630 is the time that I woke up in the morning and 2200 or 10 o'clock is the time I went to bed. Um, so I was trying to find out if there was a connection between uh, the migraines that I had, the times that I went to sleep, the things that I was eating, how much water I was drinking or alcohol. And so the whole thing to me came together as a, a way to track my habits, track my life. And then the favorite part about it is the very little writing you do in the middle. And that's the highlight of each day. And that day um, in the Czech Republic, we went to, um, Mucha is an artist and I love his work. And we stumbled across this tiny little museum and apparently it was only temporary because we just looked for it before this, um, uh, this art league meetings began and we couldn't find it anywhere. It's gone off the street. Uh, so we were very fortunate to be able to go in and see lots of this. It looked like someone's almost personal collection because I know the big museums in Prague. And we also went to a Moldavite museum and I'm not wearing my Moldavite today. And I did not know that it was uh, what some people consider to be a very powerful crystal. I just liked it because it was green uh, set in silver. <laughs> so I bought it. But we went to the museum and learned all about this big crater or this uh, meteorite that hit um, many hundreds of thousands of years ago. And then um, it shot off rocks and it turned green, it like melted. And in the atmosphere, it turned green and landed in the Czech Republic. So this meteor landed in Germany and then spewed all this beautiful green glass um, in this one particular part um, of the Czech Republic, and it happens to be Chesky Krimlov. So we had a lot of fun with that. Um, and uh, I just wanted to share this with you as an example. Oh, I will show you my, my two pages. Um, hang on just one moment. Uh, now one of the ways I help people um, remember their days <clears throat> is, and to try to set up this symbolic journal, is to think of it as built on your core values. Um, so the first thing I do, this I have a two-part workshop that I'm beginning to offer in May on this. And my daughter's actually creating a journal that we can buy that already has all these tiny little um, squares set up. You can see what my pages look like. That's two months worth of journaling. And it, each one just took me two minutes at night. And it was just the most fun thing to do because at, even as a writer, I'm a terrible journaler. I do not like journaling. I've tried a hundred times. I buy these beautiful journals thinking that it will um, <laughs> incite me to, to write more and it doesn't. I'm the kind of writer that sits down and writes essays um, about the things I see or experience in life. But journaling, it just doesn't cut it. So symbolic, when I finally created symbolic journaling, I was very happy because now I can go back and in one book will contain about five years of journaling. Um, and so my daughter is my creative director here at The Cheerful Word and at Mountain Page Press, which we're launching next week. And she's creating a new journal with all of those blocks already put in there. And the first couple of pages uh, will be like perforated so that you can write down your own key and keep that private if you want, if you so choose. Um, or if you're like me and I lose the key, I have to try to remember what it was they stood for if I miss a month or two. Um, so I just wanted to uh, share this with you because um, memoir writing is really about commemorating our own lives and those things that we hold most dear. And you're never too old, you're never too young. Um, I've had sessions with elementary school kids um, and I ask them, you know, the memoir kind of things in the lives they've lived. I ask them things like, well, how do you, uh, what kind of superhero would you be if you could be a superhero? Um, so you, you speak to people depending on where they are in their journey of life. Um, I've had some amazing memoirs written by uh, college students 
because so much happens between high school and college and life changes so radically. Um, and it feels really good to commemorate that shift, that change, that new stage in life. Um, so it's been a lot of fun to have a blend of all ages in these workshops. Well, I'm gonna stop talking at this point and I'm happy to answer any questions, but um, I do encourage you to be artistic. I'm sure you have a hundred ideas on how you would prefer to do your own symbolic journal <laughs> and make it a lot prettier than mine is, but uh, mine functioned for me. So I'll go ahead and, and open the floor for questions if you have any. Um, can everyone hear me on Sam's microphone? Just give a nod. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I thought that was just fascinating and it ties in so well with what um, Kara had to say. I mean, I, I, I'm thinking about as we all go through these next few months looking forward to a new life, a, a fun life again, it would really be wonderful to, to journal it and watch how much better you feel over time, because I know we're all gonna get there. Mm -hmm. And it, it might help to even alleviate some of the, I just don't think I can wait any longer feeling to, yes. to document each day. I mean, I'm thinking personally about how I could use this just even in how I, what I choose to paint each day, because some of the things that I work on, I really enjoy and some of them I don't. And mm -hmm. this would help me analyze which days did I feel happy and yeah, what yeah. did I accomplish. And, and I love the, the, the recording the moments. And I'm thinking there are times when I go and I see a musician and, you know, your body tingles. It's just so good. Yes. <laughs> you, you wish you could have those feelings every day. And to be able to look back and at your at your memoir or your journal and see how much how much of that experience you have and, and how good it is so i thought this was just really fascinating thank, thank you. you we can open it up does anyone else have any comments or questions and just flip on your mic and raise your hand and we'll go back to the gallery view so we can see everyone Hello. Let me ask, when, when did you say your class was again, uh, Sam, when you're new? It starts May something. Let me look it up really quickly. <laughs> May something, I promise. I just put them on my website, so oh, I'm well, not remembering. And I'm adding three other workshops, but this is the first one because it was the most important to me. Da, da, da. May fifth and eleventh, and that one that one's in the evening actually from seven to eight p.m. Uh, both of them, both y yes, so yep. One follows the other. We do the setup in the beginning in the first one, and then the second week we come back and and review what we've started. Oh, so it's two days. It's a two day workshop. It's a two day workshop, one hour each. So okay. would you go to cheerfulworld.com? Uh, cheerful word, W-O-R-D. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I would love to create a cheerful world, <laughs> one memoir at a time. <laughs> I will include information on how to reach out to both Sam and Kara. Oh, okay. um, when I, uh, because we have recorded the workshop and so, or the meeting. And um, then at the end, I'll also include the information for everyone, and we'll put it in our next newsletter as well. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? I just wanna say something, I'm over here. I just wanna thank you for that little bit of journaling that you showed us, because I hate journaling. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. Words. And that, I every time you were saying this is what, because when you first put it up, I said, this is so freaking confusing. <laughs> I'm not, I, I, am, I don't know what the heck she's trying to say here. But whenever you started explaining it, it was just, it, it, it resonated with me. Mm -hmm. And I really, really enjoyed your little symbols, your little this, your little that. And then whenever you showed, you know, the, your pages, mm -hmm. that could be the artwork. You should have those things framed. 
Well, there you go. <laughs> no one could understand it, but it'd be beautiful. No, but it would just be like a little abstract. Like you could say, you know, you could just make them teeny weeny and do a whole year and have it printed out and frame it. This was my 19, you know, 2001 year. This is the COVID year. That would be super cool. <laughs> that would be super cool. I love the idea. Yeah. But anyhow, I, I really enjoyed your little presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I don't know how this meeting is going to go, so I wanted to say something um, in reference to Kara. Um, I think you said something. Like, I have a 13-year-old grandson who has really suffered during COVID, and I love the idea of doing those art projects with him, Kara. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones where you're creating your feelings in color and form. And I think he'd be very open to that. For all ages, but I think children especially are, are less critical of their art. If you hit that sweet spot, um, mm. and really get into the, the mindfulness aspect of it and, and get the, you know, tap into their breath and, and receive the benefits just a little bit more easily than we can. True. By the way, if anyone wants, um, I have a list of a hundred um, prompts to talk about um, COVID. So if you have anything that you wanted to write down, it's like, you know, what new have you done? Have you, you know, are you wearing yoga pants every day? Are you? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Have you, I know. Gonna, going back into real clothes is going to be the worst shock of all. Cause I'm not going to. I love my yoga clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you mean, Sam? You have a list. We could have the list. Is that what? Yes. Yep. I, I'm happy to share that link uh, okay. with Diane, and she can send it out to you. And you okay. Can that would be awesome. Download the PDF and... Right as you will. All those things we can think about. Yes. <laughs> the only positive thing with COVID was yoga clothes. Yeah. I'm keeping them. Yes. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. And we all learned how to use Zoom, which I was always a yes. on FaceTime. Yes. <laughs> but That's it true. certainly has helped us stay connected. So. Well, I really appreciate everyone joining us and a big thank you to Kara and Sam. Thank you thank so you. much, thank both you. of you. Very thought provoking and um, I'm so happy we were able to do it. So thank you. And we'll um, 